recording. All right. Um, welcome, welcome. First up, before we really jump in, I would just like to ask that everyone please mute your microphones unless you're speaking. You know to, I'm not going to do that. would be really you helpful. Know how to make video, right? um, I can mute everyone, but I'd rather. I'd rather leave it up to you all individually. <laughs> um, so please mute your microphones when you're not talking. Um, you know what, let's just do the mute all for now anyway, and you'll be able to unmute yourselves. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are. Um, great to see some, some familiar faces and names in here and some people I don't know, which is even better. Uh, what's up, Daniel, Maurice, Nick, Haley, Mr. Demby? I see you all here. Excellent. Um, we're going to have a few more rolling in. So I'm just kind of, let me stall for a few minutes while, while people do roll in. Um, Mr. Atias, I see you. Excellent. <laughs> I know a lot of people who, who know me have seen me kind of banging on about Web3 this, NFT that, and being like, what is he talking about? Um, and it seems as time goes on, it becomes apparent that maybe he's talking about something that might be interesting. So the uh, hence today's public Zoom. I did one of these a couple of months ago, um, and it was really it was really fun and kind of useful. I think for a lot of people and interesting for me to be able to share kind of my experience and perspective too. Um, so how should we do this? Um, I'm going to keep an eye on the text chat as best I can. If you have questions as we go, you can drop them in the text chat. If it's a, an appropriate moment in time, you're welcome to unmute and um, just ask over the mic. Um, Joshua, what up? Will this recording be shared? Yes. Um, it's being recorded and everyone who registered will be sent the archive link. Um, I know a lot of people can't necessarily make it live and some of you may have to dip part way through. So um, there will be an archive. Uh, I imagine we'll be here for about an hour and a half um, as far as time goes. And I appreciate that you know people have different levels of experience and knowledge and understanding with this general topic. So for some, we'll be covering some things you'll know about. For others, we might even be starting ahead of what you know. Um, so if we're doing that, I would encourage you to you know, do a bit of research to kind of fill in any gaps. And as often gets said in the space, no matter what anyone tells you, do your own research. It's so vital. So no one can say, oh, Mark told me to do this. <laughs> because you all did your own research, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, vital. And um, I want to, how many have we got here? Yeah, I think, I think we're pretty good to go for now. Excellent. So I want to kick off um, with just a little bit of kind of super, super 101, and then I will share, you know, my journey into the Web3 space. Um, we'll highlight some platforms uh, that I think are really great to know about and look into, especially for music in the space um, and open to Q&A. So first up, most importantly, I'm no expert. I'm here experimenting in the space. And that's what inspires me the most is that I get to experiment in public. If anyone tells you that they're a crypto expert or a Web3 expert or an NFT expert, then run for the hills because <laughs> there's no such thing. The space evolves so fast and changes so fast that expertise is impossible. So we're all involved basically experimenting in public. Now, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for this for, for many reasons, but one kind of bigger picture reason is that I believe it's, this is twofold. Up to this point in time, I think the music industry has been designed specifically to be exploitative. It's been designed to take advantage of creatives and have people in power make the money. Um, that I think is pretty irrefutable. If, you know, for those of you who've released music, you know, you can look at your royalty statements if you need a reminder, but it's kind of, it's real. Um, and so, in tandem with that, the music industry has always evolved ahead of the creatives. And I say that to mean that, for example, as technology has evolved, we've played catch up. 
like musicians weren't involved with developing the vinyl format, the CD format, the MP3 format, streaming, anything. We weren't, we weren't part of that conversation. The, the formats, the technologies exist, and then we have to fit the technology. In the same way, up to this point, the music industry infrastructure, as far as where our money is, that's been very intentionally kind of convoluted and, and ob ob obfuscated um, in that our mechanical royalties are over here, our performance royalties are over here, there's master royalties, there's, it's all in different places, and there's a different person or the organization controlling each of these places. So for me to get 100% of the pie, which I deserve because of my piece of music that's been published, I have to reach into all these organizations, have memberships, and all these middlemen take a cut, and it's just, it's very, it's very complicated, and I, I believe that's by design in order for these organizations to keep the lion's share of money and people can't, the artists can't find their money. Um, so I'm really excited by this technology because it solves all of these problems potentially. You know, decentralized technology, and we talk in, in crypto, we talk a lot about smart contracts. And uh, I will preface this, preface this by saying, when I say smart contracts and when I say royalties, to not get confused with what we know of as contracts and royalties because they're, they're different things. So a smart contract is essentially a digital, a digital agreement. It's a program, which is basically if, when, if, or when, if, when this happens, or if this happens then do this. And so we have, we have kind of like bio human analog smart contracts in the music industry where we have a person that does this, a person gets our mechanical income and collects it. And then we've got to get it from them. And it's very, like I said, convoluted. But you imagine that all these people, all these individual organizations are just lines of code on a contract. So in theory, and we're not at this point yet, but in theory, a piece of my music gets played on radio in, in Switzerland and instantly every aspect of that which needs to go to anyone gets sent to them automatically by a smart contract. It doesn't require a human being, doesn't require any intervention, it's automatic, forever, done. So for me, that's super exciting. You know, labels, generally speaking, you know, there's a clause in every contract which says you can audit us once a year, but it's on you to pay the cost for that. And no artist ever does it. It's a big deal. It's a lot of admin work. So labels know they're not going to get audited. So kind of business as usual. But the blockchain is such that it's a public ledger. It's open to everyone. It's totally, it's transparent. It's immutable. It can't be changed. And so it's, it just is. For me, that as a, as a founding kind of premise is incredible. Like the idea of having automated digital systems that basically cut out the middleman. You know, the idea of owning distribution is amazing to me. You know, what, right now we're beholden to Spotify's $0.003 per stream or whatever it might be. Um, and this is kind of a, like a trauma in the industry where it's like, you know, you might make a song or a track and you pour your heart and soul and blood, sweat and tears into it. And then you're conditioned to knowing that it's worth $1 per download and $0.003 per stream. And I don't agree. I don't agree that's the value of my music, like period. And so we're talking about technology which offers a value proposition for music, but also it doesn't mean that no one else can hear it. Like NFTs are such that everyone can come and listen to it. You can come and watch a video, listen to a song for free, cool. But if you wanna collect it, if you want a digital collectible, then you can invest in that, you can, you can pay for that. And that money goes directly to the, the creator. So these are kind of the, the basic ideas behind why I think this is really important and, and revolutionary. Um, we talk a lot about Web3. I mean, there are, three, there are three core words here, Web3, NFT, blockchain. <laughs> and those three things, and you, you could make crypto the fourth, you know, those words in themselves um, are a little... Kind of vague for a lot of people there's also a mainstream media narrative where all of it's a scam and i i definitely you know i get some pushback like i did a mail out to my mailing list some of you are here because of that i was like yeah i'm doing this public workshop on web3 and music nfts on friday 
I got one reply was like, crypto's a scam, convince me otherwise. I'm like, cool, but it's not my job to convince you. Like, and I ended up actually, I did reply to some extent. And there's a perspective where it's like, you can say, well, anything's a scam. I mean, you know, money fundamentally is a construct that governments have, have endorsed. And most governments, the money's not even backed by anything physical anymore. Like, you know, there's no gold standard in, in, in the US. The, the pound sterling, as in sterling silver, one of their prime ministers, Tony Blair, sold all of their silver, all of it. So there's nothing backing that either. So, you know, money is a construct. Maybe money is a scam. Maybe some of you think tax is a scam. You know, maybe some of you think Spotify is a scam. Like, I feel like anything when it comes to money can be a scam. Um, you know, I think everyone here is familiar with the emails where it's like some son of a prince from Bahrain um, who has $300 million in their account needs some help transferring it because blah, blah, blah. And therefore, is email a scam? Like, no, you know, scams exist, you know, in the, in the fine art market, art fraud is, is a multi, 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 multi million dollar industry. That's a scam. So just to say, when people say it's a scam, I'm like, well, people, there are scammers everywhere, but let's not kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I think that's a really important aspect. Um, if you, just on that note, if you, if you do the research online, just like anything from vaccinations to anything, if you want to find a certain truth on either side of the story, you will find it. So if you want to find articles which convince you it's a scam, they'll do that. If you want to find other ones, they'll do that too. So that's where do your own research really comes into it. But this conversation is based on the idea that we fundamentally agree that there's something here worth looking at. Like, I'm not here to have the whole, is it a scam conversation? You're welcome to have that with your friends elsewhere. <laughs> so just very quickly, what is Web3? Web3 is the kind of catch-all phrase for the current iteration of the internet, where if I tell you what Web2 is, it'll make more sense. Or let's go back to Web1. Web1, for those of you who are on the internet circa 1994 through the late 90s, is like, you know, we could all build our own sites and like there, there were little, there were some networks, but it was kind of like, you know, you build your own thing and you have your own store and it was a great idea, but it was a little early. And then Web2 came in and these platforms came in with huge amounts of money, a lot of developers, and they created these structures, which we now know as social media platforms, which basically, you know, they looked better than the, than the website you could make at home. They created a community of people, so you have a um, you can you can kind of funnel whether it's socially or business wise. You have these community platforms. The problem is is that all of these platforms and Facebook is a decent example. Facebook became a multi billion dollar company because we all contributed to it, and we got nothing back for that. Not only did we get nothing back, but then Facebook are like, oh, and if you want everyone who wants to see your shit to see your shit, you've got to pay money. So this is problematic. And then you put on top of that, when the day comes that Facebook is no longer, if or when, I said when, but if or when, <laughs> then everything we put on Facebook is gone forever. Blam. You know, anyone here who had a MySpace can relate to this. Like everything you put on MySpace, it's gone. You know, I would love to read some of whatever I wrote or music I posted or that'd be cool to see, just like a photo album from when I was growing up, right? Gone. So the idea with Web3 is that, with, is that with these platforms no longer matter because whatever your content is, you own, you can take it wherever you go. And this is what an NFT is essentially. If you have some content that you share and it's tethered to a smart contract, an NFT, then if you leave that platform or go to that platform or take it over there, it's always there with you. And the proof that that is connected with you to you, you own it, is always present through the smart contract. So the value in that is pretty amazing because also we have platforms now in Web3 where by partaking, you end up basically becoming a co-owner. Like it's having, like imagine if you spend a decade on Facebook and then they're like, oh, thanks for contributing to our platform for a decade. Here's some Facebook tokens that are worth money. And those Facebook tokens 
give you a vote, a seat at our table to vote. Now, obviously, Mark Zuckerberg is never in a million years going to do that. But that's, that's the value proposition in a nutshell. So the idea of Web3 being decentralization, the data decentralized, which means there's no central server. So if, um, for example, I don't want to pick on Facebook too much. If, <laughs> if, SoundCloud, if SoundCloud servers went down, then everything on SoundCloud's gone, right? So the idea of decentralized servers is, is or decentralized data protocols with peer-to-peer -peer data sharing, there is no server. There's none at all. There's these nodes. So people running computers, which are basically peer-to-peer -peer data sharing. Anyone's used torrents, then that's a, a similar kind of concept. So the idea being, as long as one person is running a node for a platform, it'll be slow. But as long as one person believes in it, it'll keep going. And tokenomics and crypto work in a way where by running a node, you're getting paid for running a node. So it's kind of like a job. So if someone believes in a platform and more people do, then you have more people running nodes. They, they're connecting these data packets. They're all earning for being part of the system. And the system, system goes on forever as long as these people believe in this platform existing. If, they, if, if Facebook was like this and there came a point where people decide this is not worth running and the nodes stopped working on it, then there'd be no more Facebook. So it's a different kind of data proposition. Um, that in a nutshell is what Web3 is. So um, what is blockchain? I would encourage you to Google that. It's, it's not that complicated, but it can be presented in a complicated way. I don't want to dig into the, the background tech too much today because we've got a lot of other stuff to talk about. Um, but it's the underpinning technology, which is how this works. It, but in short, the data, as opposed to a database file, we're used to seeing a spreadsheet, which might be a database. A blockchain is a database where the data fills a block. And when that block is fill, full, it gets added to the last block on the chain and so on. So you get this chain of blocks, a blockchain. And the reason that's secure is because you can't go back to a block in the chain and change the data. On a database, you can you totally can change the data. So that's what they say called immutable. Um, again, I don't want to get too bogged down on what is a blockchain. <laughs> so then what is an NFT? An NFT is such that it's, let's forget digital, it's a box. The NFT is a box. I can put anything in a box, absolutely anything. So now we say it's a digital box. Not only is it just any digital box, but every single digital box has a fingerprint which is a contract address on the blockchain. So I can put anything in that box. For example, I love basketball. There's a, a, an NBA second year player named LaMelo Ball. LaMelo Ball put out an NFT where if you buy the NFT, then the, the box, so to speak, the box you now have access to, and the NFT is the key to access the box. So you go to access the box, the box checks your wallet, your crypto wallet. It sees the NFT. So yes, you can come in. And then over LaMelo Ball's NBA career, they're going to populate this box with more and more stuff, highlights, personal stuff, whatever it might be. So for me as a basketball fan, if I had a LeBron James vault like that, like I had 19 years of LeBron's career, like, a, like an archive, that's pretty cool. So yeah, Lars, an NFT can be dynamic. Um, and that's, that, there's, that's a layered question that I don't want to get into too much for the use of for today's um, conversation, but short answer, yes. Um, so it's easy to, it's, it's super easy to have that kind of setup where you create a vault and kind of change the content. So an NFT is, it can be anything. It can be a piece of music. It can be a film. It can be a picture of a monkey, um, which those of you that have been in the space at all know what I mean. Um, but it's, it's, the question is like, what can the NFT do? What does it represent? What is it for? Why do I want it? And with music, there's a range of answers here. Like the fundamental thing I've found with collectors is like, why do you want to collect a music NFT? Because I love the music. And like, that is wild. Like considering the world we live in, where it's like, oh, I'm trying to get on a Spotify playlist or like I've done plenty of album release shows where someone will be there and be like, yo, so what's coming next? It's like, I just put out a new album, man. Like what? what? <laughs> so to bring that back to basics where someone's saying, yeah, I collect music NFTs because I love the music. That's incredible to me. And so you have a value offering where someone is happy 
to spend way above and beyond the price of a stream. I mean, it's whatever price you set, but they, they feel like they're investing in a musician, supporting or an artist, it could be not only musicians, investing in a creative, collecting their work like you collect art, and then this and, and they're supporting supporting the cause, so to speak. At the same time, anyone can view the video, listen to the music. You know, someone owns a Basquiat and it's in a gallery. Anyone can look at the Basquiat, but someone owns it. So it's that kind of it, it's giving that value to digital assets, which we've never had before. Like I'm, you know, the, the age I am and how I grew up, I definitely grew up in that idea of like, oh, just you know, right click save or just duplicate file it's this is the same file like isn't digital amazing i can duplicate an image and it doesn't degrade it's the same thing right and yes it is as far as the binary ones and zeros of the content of the of a of a piece of music or a picture or a video it's the same thing however if it's tethered to a smart contract if it's tethered to a to a fingerprint id on the blockchain then you might have the same this is a picture for, for argument's sake. You might have the same JPEG as I do, but my one's tethered to a contract. So not only can I go and buy and sell that NFT, I can use it to unlock something. Like what it, it could give me access to all sorts of stuff. Your one is just a JPEG. So the idea of digital of owning a digital asset and a digital, digital asset having unique value, that was brand new to me. You know, I think that for the next generation, it's different. Like they're digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant. So I think that's kind of a leap that a lot of us have to make. When I first came into the space, I was definitely like, let me right click and save this. Oh, it's on my desktop now. Well, I've got it now. That's what I thought. But that's before I, before I understood what can be done with this and the value proposition of having a digital asset that has a unique fingerprint, so to speak. And I use this word fingerprint kind of metaphorically to talk about its smart contract and it's how it's registered on a blockchain. So hopefully that's like some clear kind of super basic intro to what these things are. Um, I wanna share kind of my journey into the space and kind of some, some of the different use cases that I've employed already, um, which kind of illuminate different what's possible in different ways. Um, I was, I would say, it's funny when I when I try and recall this, I get confused what year we're in and what year it was, which I think a lot of us have that issue at the moment. So 2022, 21. So late 2020, um, I was kind of looking around in the space. I saw a, a colleague of mine from LA, a great sax player named Sam Gendel. Sam had minted a video on a NFT website marketplace called Zora. And he posted something kind of, Kind of enigmatic about it on his instagram so i was like oh what's this let me go and have a look and so i saw this video i was like okay that's weird and someone paid for it okay <laughs> and i think at the time it was equivalent equivalent of 300 dollars um it might have been one eth even back then i can't even can't remember what that was but it was about 300 bucks and so i i right click and saved it i was like it's on my desktop and that was the first thing i did and then i then Sam did a few more videos. So I kept going back to Zora and I, then I started clicking around looking at what other people were doing and seeing that, oh, people are buying and selling videos and JPEGs and music, um, like Disclosure uploaded some random demo jam and some fan bought it. Um, and so it was clear to me, this is, this, is a real, this is a real thing. So what really made a difference for me was, was being able to interact with the space. And what that meant was, having a MetaMask wallet, putting some ETH in it, and being able to go shopping. And I liken this to, if you go to one of your favorite shops, some designer, whatever it might be, so some, some shit you love, but you have no money, then you're walking around that shop very consciously window shopping, right? And like, if only, if only, if only. But if you walk into the shop and you have money in your wallet, then your relationship with the shop is totally different. Like. Oh, I love that. Let me grab that. <laughs> and so that's how it felt when I went back into Zora with some ETH in my wallet. I'm like, okay, cool. Now I'm here as a participant. And then, you know, seeing something I like, which wasn't expensive and being like, oh, let me, let me grab this. I was also supporting this music community. Cool. And then so my first NFT purchase made me think, I mean, it was a feeling and I can't even explain this. Like 
what it feels like to own something digital that a year ago you couldn't have convinced me that there was anything about any such thing as ownership around a digital asset. So I can't I can't give you that feeling, but that's that's how I got to that point. And so then at the same time, I'm thinking, cool, I want to be in the space because I've always loved technology. I've always been somewhat anti-authoritarian and anti-system, like, you know, let's just let's let's burn the building kind of kind of thing. And so this is this is a chance to burn the building. Let me see how this works. So the time I was working on a on a uh, a live stream set, a pre-recorded live stream set for an arts presenter in the States. And I had some footage that I'd shot in Japan the summer before the pandemic, all this nature footage. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I was just like, let me shoot this footage. It's beautiful. I'm going to use it for Instagram or something. Um, and then I was asked to do this live stream pre-record. So I did a set doing a solo performance of my own Japanese related material. And then I cut it to this footage that I shot in Japan. So it's kind of like a audio visual tone poem kind of immersive sensory thing. Um, and so this arts organization, they, they streamed the show, um, the, the, the pre-record. And that was it, it was a one and done. So then I, I own it anyway. And a friend of mine, his name is Sersu, um, who's very prolific in the Web3 space. Sersu coincidentally was an artist in residence in Japan on the residency when I did shoot the original footage. So he was, he had a connection to it too. I showed him the footage and he was like, man, you have to mint this. This has to be an NFT. And it hadn't really occurred to me at that point to do that. And also no one had ever put an audiovisual album on the blockchain, like a 43 minute long video was totally unprecedented. But he kept pushing me. And part of the reason he kept pushing me, which has become my kind of founding reason for being in the space is he was like, this is cultural narrative and we have to put culture on chain. And what does that mean? So what that means is if we don't put culture on the blockchain in 20 years time, we'll look at the blockchain and it'll be full of FinTech, like, like finance bros and just like heavy tech academic shit and like, and monkeys, yes, Lars. <laughs> um, and, and where will the culture be? So that was, that was how he mentored me in. And what's really my kind of angle with it is we're putting culture on chain. What is that? This is like a, a permanent, immutable time capsule of culture for future generations. That is fucking wild to me. Excuse my language. Um, super wild to me. Like the idea that we're creating a time capsule that is democratic, anyone can contribute, it's immutable, can't be changed. It's there forever. Amazing. And when people say, what do you mean it's there forever? Well, like I mentioned with node operators before, as long as people believe in it, it will continue to be maintained. And so some people said to me, well, what about when something happens and blockchain tech is, is, is gone? And the answer is, if something could happen to destroy blockchain tech, as a species, we will have much bigger problems. You know, primarily, we'll probably all be dead. So it's like, it's not even an issue. So as long as we're here, I'm pretty confident in tech, this will be here. If we end up losing all electricity and go back to, you know, pre-electricity pre civilization, that's a different conversation. But again, bigger things to worry about than where's my NFT? Um, so I want to, um, Lars has mentioned monkeys a couple of times and I have too. So I want to tap into that just super quickly because people have seen this. People have seen things like, um, there's a, um, Siba, I'll come back to that in one second. Actually, no, let's do it right now. So can an NFT be, I think you mean, can an NFT be taken down? A blockchain can't be taken down and an NFT, it can be burned which means sending an NFT to a wallet address that no one owns. And there is a standard burn address. Like if you've ever seen a wallet address, it's like a hexadecimal string of, I think 24 numbers and letters or something. And a, the burn address is literally something like zero X, zero, 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 however many zeros. And you send something there and it gets burned because no one has access to that wallet address. 
um, so something can be taken down. Um, and see, but I don't know that specific instance, but there are absolutely scams in this space. I'm not saying that's a scam, but like I mentioned with email, when some Nigerian prince emails you for asking for, for money, there are scams. So whenever you kind of engage with a project, I do your own research, which kind of leads to what I was about to say about the monkeys, which are actually apes. Um, so, and see, but I'm gonna look into that too, because that's interesting. Like when, when high profile individuals come into the space, don't know what they're doing or get bad advisors, some weird shit can happen and it has been happening. But because everything's transparent, you can do the research to see if something's legitimate or not. Um, so actually, before I get into monkeys, let me mention, <laughs> this whole thing is based on crypto. Like cryptography, is a technology, we call it crypto for short. And most people, when they hear crypto, they think of Bitcoin um, and Elon Musk, which, uh, you know, and those are huge things in, into themselves. But to know that crypto is highly volatile, highly volatile. And once you're in the space, this is no big deal. It's like Ethereum swings 20%. I'm like, oh, it swings 20% almost every day, cool. But for the mainstream media, they'll be like, oh my God, Crypto just lost 20% and the world's falling apart, but it's not, it's going to come back up. I mean, that's my belief in the long term. And also, ultimately, if crypto as a value proposition, as in how much Bitcoin's worth, how much Ethereum's worth, if that crashes, then we still have the tooling that's been made. And I believe this tooling, especially for independent creatives and pertinent to today's conversations to musicians, I believe this tooling in the worst case scenario is a better value proposition than the current music industry is. To me, just, just zero question about that. Happy to argue it, but that's my perspective. Um, so then just to touch on monkeys before we get into the music properly. Board Ape Yacht Club, hugely successful project. And some of you would have seen this. It's like, it's pictures of apes. And um, for people who, who aren't familiar, it's like, well, why, you know, why are they just pictures of apes? Boy, the Yacht Club. I'm just pulling up the screen share, actually. Um, here we go. Let's screen share this. Some of you will have seen these. Some of you will have not. This is the Board Ape Yacht Club. I'm looking at them on OpenSea. So you can see that it's basically the same ape, but with variations. This is what's called a PFP collection, or a PFP project stands for Profile Picture because a lot of people use these as their profile pictures, say on Twitter. So the idea is that these are their avatars. So it's like, well, why would, I want a, why would I want an ape like this? I mean, let's just for argument's sake, let's say, let's see what the highest price one is right now. Oh, look, this is the cheapest one, 87 ETH. That is approximately $200,000, the cheapest one. Not the fanciest ape, big money. Why would someone want this is the question. Why would someone want this? And the answer is pretty cool. So Board Ape Yacht Club is a great example. 10,000 JPEGs of apes. Each one is uniquely individual. These are created by creating layers of different characteristics and then, they, then they're assembled by a, by a code and the code knows not to duplicate any one. So all 10,000 are individual. So if I hold one, Kind of wish I did, because if you if you bought them on if you bought them when they came out, you're paying like seventy bucks or something, and now the cheapest one is two hundred thousand dollars. But anyway, if I had one, then I'm automatically I'm a member of the Board Ape Yacht Club. If you remember what I mentioned earlier about an NFT unlocking a key to unlock something, that's what it is. So this project, from selling all these JPEGs, they have a treasury, a fund. Everyone who owns one has a vote as to how that treasury gets used. So Board at the Yacht Club, for example, bought a sick baller mansion in Miami that any Board at the Yacht Club holder can use at any time. So what's the utility? Here's the utility. It's like a social club without the building or something. And again, you might be like, well, so what? I don't want to go to Miami. Okay, well, there's another one called, say, Alpha Girl Club. And their whole thing is around mental health. And so they have, you know, maybe 5,000 or so holders and they're building mental health 
projects. So if you hold it, you're going to get access to that. Exactly. Yes, Lars. The apes are individual membership passes. They're also a flex, obviously. You know, you have something worth half a million dollars and that's your, that's your Twitter kind of profile picture. It's a flex. But you're also saying, I'm a board ape. I'm part of this. And there are so many of these profile picture projects. But this is speaking to the idea where people say, yeah, NFTs is just selling, you know, JPEGs of apes for millions of dollars. I mean, yeah, that's part of it, but there's a functionality here. So now if I made, a, made an analog with this to Costco, those of you not in the States don't know what Costco is, but Costco is a place where basically it's like a supermarket, but everything's at wholesale prices and you buy in bulk. So it's cheap, but you can only go to Costco if you have a Costco membership card. And this is in the real world, right? Let's forget we're free for a second. So what if Costco only ever made 1,000 membership cards and those 1,000 membership cards were sold for $1,000 each and they're all sold out, but I want a Costco card. So it would follow that I would go to a Costco card holder and say, let me give you $10,000 for your card. That would follow, right? That's, that's a logical progression. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a digital version of that. Um, <laughs> what up, what up, Zimmy? <laughs> yes, Sabella, exactly. Membership has its privileges. I mean, and I'm I'm not certainly saying that every musician should start a PFP project, um, because if you have a successful one, you have a huge treasury, but at the same time, you have a lot of responsibility to rec to, to support your community, because suddenly you have a huge community to, to build. Um, but I wanted to mention that whole aspect because it's a big part of the anti-NFT argument. It's just pictures of apes or whatever. So hopefully I've shared a little bit of light on what that is. So, sorry, going back to my process into the, my story into it. So I made this film, this audiovisual tone poem, um, audiovisual album. Sursu encouraged me to mint it because we need culture on chain. And so that's what I did. I minted the film on a platform called Zora. And then the film has eight compositions on it. So I minted those as one of one music NFTs on a platform called Catalog Works or Catalog. Um, and then I had an edition collection, like a cheaper kind of entry, entry level NFT. And so basically all these NFTs represented this project. And most of it has sold over the last seven months. You know, it wasn't quick, but it, most of it sold. And again, why are people buying this? It's because they connected with the narrative of what I'm sharing and they love the music and they wanna be part of that story. So for example, what happens with this? Um, yes, Yogi, I'll do that in a second. Um, let's do that right now even. So the, uh, the only, and the only I, I will preface this, preface this by saying the only issue with the Motherland project is because the video 24 minutes is so long that it takes forever to buffer off the current system, um, which is this peer-to-peer -peer node system. So here's the homepage for the project. I put it in the chat link. Um, there's a YouTube link for the video as well because of those buffering issues. But so what, so what happened with this amongst other things is that the one person bought the film I think it was like 1.25 ETH, which today is probably close to three grand, I think. Um, and in this case, someone bought the film and the way I had it set up was the film holder gets a, gets a portion of all the other sales in the collection. So there's kind of a, a gamified incentive. Um, which the collector actually didn't end up caring about anyway. So that's all good. Um, but it's a bonus for them. It's, it's not the reason they bought it. But the, the, the value proposition here also comes down to secondary royalties. And I mentioned we're talking about royalties and contracts in this and to maybe forget about how we think of those in music. So secondary royalties are what really sold me on the idea of music NFTs. So I have a, a story I like to use to, to illustrate this, which is based around the idea of a first edition pressing of John Coltrane's Love Supreme album signed by John Coltrane. That would be a pretty special asset, right? So let's say 
I'm in some, I'm in Tokyo, I'm looking through a record shop and I come across this, this record. First edition, Love Supreme, 1960 whatever, signed by Coltrane, $1,000. I'm like, cool, that's a steal, I'm buying it. So I go to, I take it to the shop counter and I pay them $1,000 and I own the record. How much of that $1,000 of the secondhand record, how much of that does the Coltrane estate get? The answer is zero. Now, if I stream a Love Supreme on Spotify, the Coltrane estate makes more money than should I buy that vinyl for $1,000. Crazy shit. Okay, so now I own this vinyl. Now, I have lots of musician friends and most of them would look at this as the holy grail. Oh my God, did you hear Mark has a first edition Love Supreme vinyl pressing signed by Coltrane. So then one of my musician friends would hit me up and be like, man, I want it. How much do you want for it? I'd be like, well, I bought it for a grand. I'll sell it to you for 10 grand. How much of that 10 grand does the Coltrane estate get? Zero. And I can keep going, right? Like there's no reason why that vinyl shouldn't be worth half a million dollars. How much of that half a mil does Coltrane estate get? Zero. So with a smart contract, we can put in a secondary royalty. So let's pretend in the story that that Coltrane vinyl is an NFT. Obviously it's a physical asset, but just let's stretch the imagination. And let's say Coltrane put in a 20% royalty on a sec for secondary. What this means is when I'm in Japan and I find that album in the store and I buy it for a thousand dollars, the Coltrane crypto wallet automatically gets $200 sent to it. And then the person I'm buying it from gets $800. When my musician friend comes to me a few months later and says, here's 10 grand, and I take the 10 grand, two grand of that automatically goes to the Coltrane crypto wallet and I get eight grand. And then down the road, when someone buys it from that person for a million dollars, the Coltrane crypto wallet gets $200,000 and so on forever, forever, forever. So what this means is, in this example, Coltrane's obviously sadly no longer with us. So Ravi, his son, maybe Ravi's son has the crypto wallet. So are we saying that my children's 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 children can benefit from this? Like, that's wild to me. You know, I was looking at my bequeathable asset as a creative as being my publishing catalog of my master's. I think most of us look at it that way. The value of my publishing catalog and masters is like, it's whatevs. I mean, it's not the Bruce Springsteen catalog, you know? It's like, it's a big catalog, but it doesn't earn like Janet Jackson's gonna earn. So what's the value of my life's work that I can bequeath and pass on to my children and their children and their children? I mean, I told my son already, it's like, yo, you're getting my crypto wallet. And he, He's almost 19, so he kind of gets it, but he doesn't get it. He's like, okay, dad. I'm like, just, just wait, just wait and see. <laughs> it's all good. But, but this, this as a concept is incredible to me, like secondary royalties that are baked into something that are there forever. Yogi, yes, generational wealth is why I'm so into NFTs, blockchains, what Yogi Yancey says. I agree. I absolutely agree. And you know, hey, is, maybe that's a scam. Maybe generation wealth for people who are not in the 1%. Is that a scam? Maybe it is. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, okay, Lars, great. How hard is it to assign these shares? So currently it's a mixed bag. Um, there are definitely platforms that don't make it easy to do splits. So, I mean, I have, I have collaborative projects. We're talking about potentially doing manual splits for now. Um, until, the, until it's really in place. And there is an issue with um, what we call interoperability or composability, how an asset can work between platforms or between blockchains. This is super early in the tech, so it can be difficult. There are definitely platforms which make it simple. Um, so again, it's a do your own research thing, uh, but the, you know, the, the premise is what we're looking at. And this is what I mentioned earlier, like as independent creatives, we are able to be aligned with this technology developing. It's not like the technology happens and then we've got to play catch up and play by its rules. You know, we can be, we're, we're one, one to one with this. So what, you know, by being in the culture and by being involved with it, we influence how it evolves. And like, 
I can't call up a tech at Facebook and be like, man, I thought it'd be a really good idea if you would implement this. You know, it's, it's not an option. But in this space, it literally is an option. Like if a few people think something is a good idea, it can actually happen. Um, man, yeah, Lars, I do mean that. I mean, for example, if I mint something on my wallet and then if it's a 50-50 share with someone, if it's a manual split, then I need to do that literally manually. Um, Gareth, what up, man? No, you can't assign ownership to someone without a wallet. Everyone has to have a crypto wallet. So in light of that idea, let me just briefly, for those who are super new to the space, I wanna share this quick, um, I'd recommend taking a screenshot of this even. This is so, this is super 101 for those who need it. It's like, how do I get started? You gotta set up an account on a crypto exchange. Coinbase is huge in the States. It might be something different where you are, but it could be any mainstream um, crypto exchange. You connect your bank account to the exchange, and then you set up a MetaMask wallet. I'll, I'll drop a, a YouTube link for how to set up MetaMask in the chat in a second, because it's very simple. Um, I'll come back to that yellow bit in a second. And then you send some, some money from your bank account to your Coinbase account. You buy some ETH or other crypto on your Coinbase account. Then you send the ETH to your MetaMask wallet. And your MetaMask wallet is what interacts with Web3 sites and apps. I put a note here that every crypto transaction fee incurs Every transaction incurs fees, gas fees, paid in the currency or token of the network you're using. So if you're on the Ethereum network, it costs ETH to make a transaction. Um, and that is that, that fee is what um, preserves basically the security and the integrity of the network. So the node operators get paid and, the, and it's, th that's how the whole thing works. Um, people complain a lot about ETH, Ethereum network having really high gas fees. It does, and it's because of the, the type of technology they use. At the same time, other people will tell you, you are putting something on a network that we all agree is gonna last forever. So a transaction of a fee of $100 or $200 shouldn't be a big deal. I tend to agree with that. This bit in yellow, safely document your seed phrase. So when you make a MetaMask wallet or any crypto wallet, you get issued with a 12 to 15 word phrase. These words, this, 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 this phrase unlocks your wallet. So if you give me your seed phrase, I have your wallet. I can do anything with your wallet that you can. So people will tell you time and time again, don't give anyone your seed phrase, keep a record of it, keep it safe. There's a lot of people who will, you know, they'll even make a paper copy of it and put in a safe deposit box. Like that's how, that's how serious it can get. Like I'm sure some of you have heard stories of someone who has, $500 million of Bitcoin locked in a hard drive that they can't open, that's because they lost their seed phrase. <laughs> so that's the 101 there for, for people who are brand new to it. Um, Siba, how do I feel about the environmental issues crypto is causing? I mean, this is a, a, a very common question and there's a lot of misnomer around this. So mining Bitcoin is pretty environmentally intensive. Minting an NFT is not. Flying, a, flying in a plane is pretty environmentally intensive. Buying some Solana is not. Like, it's so relative. So to illustrate that, for example, there's a site called carbon.fyi. Um, and it's a, it's a carbon offset calculator for blockchain. So last, after my first year, on, year of pretty intense crypto use, I went on carbon FYI and I had four tons of carbon footprint to offset. I'm like, cool, pay for that, I'm good. The next weekend, I'm in LA. I had a show, this is last October, I had a show in near Frankfurt. So I flew LA, Seattle, Frankfurt, Frankfurt, Seattle, LA in one weekend. In that weekend, my flight carbon footprint was 4.2 tons compared to my whole year on the blockchain was four tons. And, I, and I'm using Ethereum, which is not the most environmentally friendly blockchain. So that to say, it's all relative. Like big industry, they're creating environmental problems. <laughs> you know, military, manufacturing, you know, water use in big industry is insane. Like it's, it's so weird to me that people 
focus on the environment with crypto, but I think it's because it's so acutely measurable. We can measure it right down to the micro whatever, but with most big industry, we can't measure environmental impact in this way. Um, that said, if you wanna be in crypto and be super environmentally aware and conscious, there are blockchains that have negligible, almost carbon neutral impacts like Solana and Tezos um, for sure. But I mean, Ethereum is still the daddy right now. And as much as it is not as environmentally friendly, Offset is, is totally available. Um, and like I said, compared to other issues in the world with the environment, it's a non-starter. Um, Arturo just mentioned the Ledger wallet. Um, oh, that's actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. So we're kind of, we're kind of going all over the place with this conversation, but I'll make that we'll, we'll tap, tap into it now. So this is a Ledger wallet. It's, um, it's a hardware wallet, often called a cold wallet. And so basically you have software wallets and you have hardware wallets. MetaMask is a software wallet or a hot wallet. And something like this is called a cold wallet or a hardware wallet. So what this means is that if my crypto is stored in here, then, I mean, no, nothing can hack it because it's, it's not connected to anything, right? <laughs> and so, and it has a highly secure way of connecting. Um, at the same time, MetaMask as a wallet, people don't, people's MetaMasks do not get hacked unless you click on something you shouldn't have. So again, it's just like awareness or if you give someone your seed phrase, which is if you're in America and you gave someone your social security number, you can bet something bad's gonna happen, right? So it's kind of similar to that. Um, the, the idea of a, of a cold, of a hardware wallet or a cold wallet, super safe. I don't believe it's really necessary until you have enough money in crypto that would really hurt you to lose. Like, you know, if you're playing around with, a few hundred bucks and you're like, I can lose that money, then I wouldn't worry about a cold wallet just yet. Um, so yeah, so all, all, the, all the token data, Yogi, can be stored on a hardware wallet. Um, Lisa, why is this digital stuff dangerous to the environment? It's because of the computing power required, basically. Um, mining Bitcoin is highly energy intensive. Um, it takes a lot of computing power. So that's basically what it comes down to. Um, yeah. So um, going back to rewind a little bit to this Motherland project I did. So yeah, I dropped the film, dropped some one-on-one music NFTs. And then I, I dropped some more music NFTs and just kind of really started connecting with the collector community um, and, and really saw that this is a, a viable option. Now I was selling music NFTs for 0.5 ETH which today is about $1,300. And so again, what, is that, what does the collector get? Do they get the master rights over the music? No. Do they get a share of the IP, the intellectual property? No. What do they get? It's a digital collectible. You know, it's like if you buy, again, Basquiat, you buy a Basquiat, do you own the intellectual property of that Basquiat? Never, it's not possible. You know, music, we're already in this idea of like someone else can own my IP, which is some, that's some other BS that we can get into another day. But the idea that I can just sell a, a digital collectible of music because someone wants to collect the music, amazing. There are now um, platforms where you can fractionalize royalties, for example, through NFTs. So Royal is a great example of that, royal.io, um, where they'll have an NFT which represents a percentage of the royalties in your music. It's a very complicated issue. It's um, done incorrectly. It falls under something called securities fraud, which is totally illegal. Um, but Royal and other companies are doing all the legal due diligence to make it legal to do. Um, but that said, there's different ways to put value into an, into an NFT or a token. And I can illustrate that a little more with what I went into next with my own journey which was called the buyback campaign, which is a crowdfund, which I did in order to raise money in Ethereum to buy back seven of my back catalog albums from the labels who control them. So I put the link to that campaign in the, in the chat text as well. But essentially 
you know, it was, I think it was $37,000 the day we closed um, and 56 people raised that, which was incredible unto itself. Um, but some of the pushback was, well, this is like a GoFundMe. Why is it in crypto? Great question. We all know what GoFundMe is. We all know what Kickstarter is. Kickstarter, incidentally, are going into blockchain. But <laughs> that's another conversation too. Um, but to answer the question, why is this in crypto? So for the people who kind of, read down the whole thing this is where the value comes in so nfts are crypto tokens the actual music or the jpeg or the video is like the crypto token points to that that content but the the music itself is not the nft so the token is the nft so all crypto tokens are tokens whether they're nfts or a bitcoin or whatever it might be so with the buyback the the idea is that everyone who contributed to the buyback like relative to their contribution in Ethereum, they got buyback crypto tokens. Those buyback tokens are worth nothing. They have no liquidity, no, no value on the market. However, they're used for voting in my Mashy Beats community. So essentially what that means is I now have a governance committee in the community to help me move it forward. You know, what's the value in that? So I kind of paint this like the idea of if I took three of my favorite ever labels like say if i took blue note def jam and brain feeder and they they had a they had a love child baby that was my dream label and then i could have a seat at the table like to help direct how it goes forward and how how funds get raised and spent i mean that's that's amazing as a fan of music you know that's wild and so to be able to create that through the buyback campaign for me has been amazing so it's like, okay, I have all these projects I want to do, all these things I want to do, and I'm no longer alone. <laughs> so that's wild. I couldn't have done this without crypto. You know, there's no other way I can create a, a voting system, which is, it can't be forged, it's public, it's immutable, and it's instant. I mean, if, 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 if democratic elections, again, I obviously live in the US, if elections were held on chain, then those who shall not be named would never get an office ever again because you cannot do voter suppression you can't do you can't do voter fraud you can't jimmy the machine nothing and this is why a government wouldn't want elections to be on the blockchain you know unless they really believe in democracy which is a whole other conversation right um so let's let us let us kind of touch these questions as they as they happen. Um, Yogi, would this be similar to a PO app? PO apps are great. And again, because I know this is a very broad range of people here as far as experience. PO apps it stands for proof of attendance protocol. And they're basically NFTs that people use to commemorate um, anything. Like if you if you did a tour, so you do five shows on your tour, and everyone who goes to a show can redeem a PO app, which is a type of NFT, which is their proof of attendance, digital proof of, of attendance that they came to that show. And then you might say after the tour, yo, if you have five, if you have all five PO apps from my tour, then there's, there's a whole lot of bonus stuff for you. And you don't even have to be in touch with them. They just have to know that. And then they go, they, they go to your website. It's token gated. So, the, so it's set up to look at your wallet and know that, okay, do they have all five PO apps? Yes, they do. Okay, cool. Well, here's all the stems to every track of my last album. Well, here's all the videos from all the shows of the tour. Like, so as a way to really kind of um, offer value, it's, it's an interesting tool. Um, and it's, it sounds super like, oh my God, there's so much tech I've got to learn, but there's more and more tooling happening now where you don't have to code. And it's just like, it's like, you know, you can fill out a little form on a website and you have a PO app. It's, it's very simple. Nick Tyson, how much time are you spending on NFTs and are you compromising, compromising your creative time? This is a great question. And I've had this conversation recently uh, with a lot of people because in, in my Mashy Beats community, I have a thing called Creator Club where I'm mentoring um, 10 musicians in, into their Web3 kind of first adventures. And this is a thing. Like everyone's like, I need time to make my art. Um, now, this is this actually has very little to do with Web3. This is more to do with business. I believe that if you're an independent professional musician, then you're kidding yourself if you think all you're going to do is make music. Like, absolutely. 
you know, then I would say you're probably maybe not a professional musician, you're just a musician. Professional, you want to make this your career, you want to make money from this, you better be in the business. And how you balance that, that's up to you. I mean, I, I don't believe that making music is rocket science. Like when I'm in it, I'm in the zone and it's great, but it's not like I'm, you know, saving the world, doing open heart surgery or building a rocket. Like it's kind of, I love doing this. So when I'm creating, I'm creating. When I'm working on the business of my career, whether that's Web3 or something else, I'm doing that. And I think plenty of you here are familiar with that juggle. It's a reality. We can't do anything about it. Um, so I can't really answer your question kind of proportionately, but you know, I'm always making, I'm consistently making music and I'm consistently in this as well. Um, and it's a big aspect. People are like, well, how do I connect with this space and the community and stuff? And, and my answer is always the same. Right now, the entire crypto NFT community is really focused around Twitter. Twitter is the interface. And anyone who's doing something um, kind of with another layer, they'll have a Discord. I'll touch on what a Discord is in a minute. But so I say to everyone, it's like, you better be on Twitter. It's like, well, who do I follow? Well, I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe start with my account and look at who I'm following or just find the interesting conversations. It's like anything. Like if I just wanted my Twitter to be about basketball, I'd just be following NBA players and the NBA and the and the it, like all this kind of stuff. You know, you curate your feed by what you follow, right? So this is the first time that I've seen value return out of a social media platform. Like we had, we've had this thing where it's like, you got to post on Instagram every day. You should be using reels. Why aren't you on TikTok? All this, all this blah, blah, blah. And it's like, what, for more likes? Like, cool, but it's just likes. And converting likes to a call to action to revenue or more work, everyone in this room knows how difficult that is. So I'm maintaining that on say a Instagram or a TikTok or a Facebook, the value return for the amount of energy you put in is negligible. And I'm saying that for me, my experience with Web3 and crypto on Twitter, <laughs> the value return is exponential. Like I've, I've made so many new friends and community, people I haven't even met in real life yet through this. Um, and, and everyone's, there's a, there's a community feeling which I've never experienced before. Like up to this point in time in my career, I've experienced a lot of, um, a lot of you know, so-called community, but kind of built around people's egos and a lot of individuals who subscribe to a scarcity mentality that's saying it's like they want to get the bag because there's only one bag and if you get the bag then they've missed out on the bag so we, i don't want you to get the bag because i want the bag that's quite typical to me in my entire experience in, the, in professional music until this point because web3 crypto it only works if more people are involved and when more people are involved it does work and so that's when someone will be like it's a ponzi it's a scam. And I still maintain you can look at, I mean, I saw one tweet that said, you think crypto is a scam? Wait till you find out about the government. It's like, right. So yeah, whatever. Okay, and speaking to the Ponzi for a second, I think most people are familiar with Amway or Herbalife, these kinds of pyramid scheme marketing companies, which have been around for a long time. And most people know, like, a, like, a, like a, any kind of pyramid scheme, if you get in at the top, you're good. If you get at the bottom, you're fucked and everyone at the top will stay good. So if, if we were to, to, to overlay that on crypto, it's like each person in the pyramid is their own pyramid, like for real. And so the equity can be evenly distributed throughout everyone. It's not like it's diminishing. So it's, it's a different kind of concept. Um, I'm kind of catching up on questions here. Um, Yogi, this is a great question. I love that it's trustless. I question the ways the Web3 space has a soul for stopping folks from minting duplicate works or fraudulent art. This is an issue. As we know, it's not about NFTs. Art fraud happens. Music fraud happens. People take people's beats and put them out as their own, like every day, every day. Um, I mean, the, <laughs> 
I was, about, I was about to go into an example, which I don't need to. So anyway, so that to say, this happens irrespective of, of the technology. But in Web3, so for example, there was a, a, an NFT marketplace that appeared a couple of weeks ago called HitPiece. And HitPiece appeared to have every piece of music on Spotify was on HitPiece as an NFT without anyone's permission. And within 24 hours, the site was gone because the community just rose up. And it's like without the community support, these platforms don't exist. So they, they have to play fair. But to answer the question, what happens when an individual uploads something that's not their own? In a way, we can't stop that. If someone minted a piece of my own music, then I would go direct to them and I would take issue with it. And if they wanted to be belligerent about it, then um, I would get the community to support the community to support me on it. And what that means is, is that that person would basically be dead in the water moving forward. You know, it's, it's the same thing where people said to me, what's stopping me putting a one of one, meaning an NFT where there's only one of it, what's stopping me from putting a one of one on one marketplace and then putting it on another marketplace as a one of one? And I had to explain to them, it's like, that's totally unethical because you're telling your collectors, this is a one of one when it's not. And what you need to do as you build collector community is have collectors trust you. So why would they come back for more if you're going to dick them around from the beginning, right? So it's kind of, there's an element of kind of self-policing, um, self I guess. Um, but at the end of the day, when, I mean, OpenSea have taken down listings which haven't, haven't been legitimate, um, but then the Web3 space is like, this is all decentralization. How can you take down my, my stuff? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a two-edged, double-edged sword. All I can say to everyone is only mint stuff that you own outright. You know, if it's got a sample in it, you can't mint it. Someone else has licensed it and owns it. You can't mint it. It's a collaboration with someone and you haven't talked to them about it. Don't mint it. It's a remix you did for someone else. Don't mint it. <laughs> like, you know, make original art. You know, how do you, how do you want to present yourself as an artist in this world. Um, Lars, the community uses a MetaMask login to verify. Um, Connect Wallet, which you'll see on, on a lot of um, platforms, is a MetaMask interface. And that's, that's the primary interface for sure. Um, Haley, what up? Yes, yes. It's not about spending time on NFTs. It's about building a community. Um, I would definitely agree with this. And I know that this is not for everyone. Like not everyone wants to be a community builder. It's like a lot of people are like, I just want to make my music. And, you know, I'm cool with doing the business, but I'm not trying to build a community. So if you're on Instagram, Facebook, anywhere, you are trying to build a community. That is literally what you're doing. You might not be doing the heavy lift of interacting with them, but you are community building. If you want fans, you're community building. Like Beyonce is community building. Admittedly, she has a team that does it for her, but still the, the, the premise is the same, right? Um, but what I would say is tap into communities, be part of a community. If you don't wanna build a community, and it's, it is hard work, like I'll tell you that from first, first person experience, then be part of a community. And that's a big reason why I'm doing Mashy Beats. Like, it was my label and now it's this open creative community becoming a, a fully autonomous crypto-based entity. And so bringing people into that, it's like, well, here's, here's kind of an infrastructure, like a community you can tap into and we're here to support each other. So some people are about, you know, building community, some people are lesser so. At the end of the day, it's all community, right? Whether it's that one person at a gig coming up to you saying, oh my God, that was amazing, love what you do, that's community building. So whatever it might be, it's a spectrum and, and you're part of that. Um, Yogi, exactly. If, and this, like Yogi's saying, without community or a plug into community, it's like releasing an album and not telling anyone. So a lot of people think I can just come into the Web3 space, drop an NFT, make $100,000 and dip out. Doesn't work like that. Like if, if you're super, super, super hype, like Nas did this recently, Nas dropped an NFT and it sold out instantly. That stuff happens. 
but more likely is like I, I dropped the motherland collection and seven months later, there's still two pieces not sold. I'm not tripping. It's like the, the success for me is in deploying the project to the blockchain. Of course, I want to make money. Who doesn't like money? But it connects with its collectors when it connects with its collectors. In the same way, you might go to an art gallery and there could be a piece that's been in that gallery for five years. One day someone walks in there like, oh my God, I love it. That's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about you know, creative content as art, which is a whole, it's, it's a different value proposition to, you know, as I said, $0.003 a stream. Um, and so that to say, if you want in, then you have to be in. Like I had collectors who didn't collect anything from me until I'd done several drops after the Motherland collection, because then I was kind of proving I'm here. Like I'm, I believe in this tech and this community. I want to be here. I am here. I'm not going away. So now you can click what I'm doing. <laughs> um, I'm just scrolling through the text chat here. Okay, Magnus, is there some kind of metadata baked into the actual NFT the buyer downloads to prove they own it, or is that information only available online? So the NFT lives in your wallet. Like if you, for example, there's a crew called Selection who do a great radio show, curated a great crew of um, music makers. They dropped a mixtape as an NFT yesterday, which I'm going to show as an example in a bit. But um, so that, that mixtape, you know, I bought one. It's in my it's in my MetaMask. Um, I can go to OpenSea and see it there. Just actually, this, this doesn't need clarification. Something like OpenSea, you don't have to have an OpenSea account. OpenSea reads what is in your wallet according to blockchain. MetaMask is the same actually. It's just reading your wallet address and what tokens it's related to. So the the contents are not physically in a place like that. Um, but anyway, the selection drop after the drop they also made access to a dropbox of the mixtape so i could just download it and have it as an mp3 file so now i have it as an mp3 file and i have it as an nft in my wallet the mp3 file is not tethered to any contract smart contract the nft itself is so hopefully that makes some sense um zimmy hit piece we already we already know tanya great question can I create an NFT of original music that is already self-released, already on, already on Apple Music, Spotify, et cetera? Absolutely. The best example to this is an EDM artist named Blau. Early 2021, Blau had the three-year anniversary of his, of his album. For three years, this album's been out on all the platforms. It's all over YouTube. It's everywhere. He did an NFT collection celebrating the three years he made $12 million in 48 hours. It was pretty amazing for an album that's already out. So I have approached a lot of my NFT drops, like this is new music, and then dropping it in the on DSPs and stuff later on. But for me, having like going through this buyback project and being in the process of reclaiming my back catalog, I'm thinking, I'm, a, I'm gonna put up some of my old stuff because it has value. Now, where does that value come from? the Mona Lisa is the best example of this. And the Mona Lisa gets quoted a lot in the NFT space. So if you've heard it before, here it is again. But the idea is there's only one Mona Lisa, right? It's hanging in the Louvre. Some of you have seen it. And it's, it's cool to see it. It's like, oh my God, that's the actual Mona Lisa. In reality, in my, however, I, I don't know, maybe 25 years of life before I saw the actual Mona Lisa, I had seen the Mona Lisa many times. You know, I've probably seen fridge magnets, postcards, pictures and books. I've probably seen a rendition on The Simpsons. Like it's part of pop culture, right? The Mona Lisa. And all of those appearances in culture give the actual Mona Lisa more value. If the Mona Lisa didn't only existed in the Louvre, then it would have less value if its image wasn't ubiquitous. So the fact that something has been out before or is available on other platforms, doesn't detract from its value as an NFT. With the Motherland film, when the guy that collected it, there was a point where I wanted to put on YouTube, mainly because the buffering was so slow as an NFT. So I hit him up. I'm like, man, as a, just as a courtesy, do you mind if I put the film on YouTube? 
And he's like, man, of course. I, of course I don't mind. I want this out as far and wide as possible because that gives the NFT more value. So that answers your question. Nick Blow, what up, Nick? Is there still a role for labels, building community, marketing, or meta? It's a great question. Like the space is fundamentally anti-label right now. So if a label came in without kind of making friends with the space, then that would be an issue because it's, it's a gatekeeper coming in where none is needed. However, there are Web3 labels. Um, and someone actually recently termed them meta-labels, which when they broke down the definition, I, I really like that. Um, but then, you know, what's the role? So I think the role is going to change. Um, and I think generally speaking right now, the primary role for labels is bankrolling something, funding something, and then brand partnership, kind of brand association. You know, if you're on Warp Records, that's a big deal. It's Warp Records. Um, and if a label gives you 50 grand to make your album, that's 50 grand to make your album. Like, it's all, it's all great. Um, but now we're looking at a different kind of situation where maybe you don't need to get bankrolled in that way. Now we have other ways to create more money. Um, and then maybe maybe all I need from the label is like the cosign and for us to do the parties together, or it could be anything. I think what's interesting is that a lot of labels don't understand the space yet. So they're not able to kind of pivot their contracts in a way which accommodate for this. Um, and I've dealt with that already myself, you know, to a point with two upcoming projects, the label and I had to agree that neither of us could exploit NFTs on the project. And that's a shame, but we just couldn't reach an agreement. So that was what I, that was my, my statement. I was like, well, you don't agree with me. I don't agree with you. So let's nix it. Um, and that was my call for that. So there's, there's no one way to do this, which is, which is the beauty of it too. Um, I'm just scrolling through these questions. Um, Blau has a large, Siba, this is, this is important. Blau has a large following and that's key to sell your NFTs. So the logic we could, dist could distill from that is if you're brand new with no audience, then you're, you're out of luck. That's the logic here, right? So I want to illustrate with an artist named Daniel Allen. Daniel Allen has become something of a, I mean, we, we use him as an example a lot, to be honest, in the space. Um, uh, let me share. There we go. So Daniel Allen, overstimulated. Overstimulated is an EP that Daniel raised at the time it was $200,000, 50 ETH, in a weekend. Now, who's Daniel Allen? This is the point. <laughs> Daniel Allen was a brand new artist. He has this whole story here. He goes into, he goes into it all. 87 backers raised $200,000. Wild. So what did Daniel do? Daniel spent three to five months in the space, which means Twitter, Discord, following people, listening to conversations, asking questions, getting to know people. People are very welcoming, by the way. Like if someone DMs me with the most basic, basic, basic 101 blockchain question, I'm not going to be like, <laughs> that's a dumb question. You should know. I'm going to be like, oh my God, you're interested. This is great. Here's the answer. And then point you in that direction. Off you go. Um, so people are very, very welcoming in that respect. So Daniel spent a few months in the space building community. And then he dropped his crowdfund. And to say at the start of this, he had 200 Twitter followers. So in Twitter metrics, he was a non-starter. In Spotify streaming metrics, a non-starter, and he pulled this off. So for me, that's a great example of anyone being able to do this. Um, um, so I'm just trying to catch up with the questions here. Yeah, Nick Tyson, um, you've asked a couple of questions here, so I'll jump into them both. Um, so I wasn't, I didn't mean to say there's no place for labels in this. And what I'm doing with Mashy Beats, I think is an example, like that was a label. And now it's, I mean, the term meta label as undefined as it is, that is what it is, but it's a creative community. Um, and it's, it's really not about, you know, my, my catalog is at the foundation of its assets, but it's not just all about me. You know, I'm curating the culture of it, but I want it to ultimately spawn legs and arms in every direction um, and that's where a label as such can become really powerful 
you know, the idea that with Mashi Beats, if we, you know, we build the treasury up, let's say, let's say there's $100,000 in the treasury, and then we could have a vote with all the buyback holders. It's like, okay, do we want to, do we, do we want to put this money into a record with like, I don't know, Mad Lib and Shabaka Hutchins, or do we want to pay ourselves out as buyback token holders and all get some money out of this? Like it, it could be anything, but it's, it becomes a collective decision and a, and a collectively run kind of organization. Um, let, let's tap in quickly the selection drop because I did mention it being a mixtape and I know for DJs that's super interesting. Um, so I, I, I want to highlight a few different platforms and this is a nice segue into that. So we're going to start with Sound XYZ. Sound XYZ has paid out three quarters of a million dollars. That's great, you know, and they've been running for about a month. Pretty amazing. So what Sound XYZ do is they do a drop, sometimes two drops a day, and this. So this one's coming up in in forty minutes. Haley Jean Penner. Many of these are new artists too. So in thirty eight minutes and thirty six seconds or whatever, this track will play, and once it plays, then this goes live, and you can. You can buy it by hitting that ape in button, which will be, won't be grayed out. And in this case, which is pretty standard for Sound XYZ, it's an addition of 25. So it's 25 NFTs of the same song. Each NFT is 0.1 ETH. So every single drop Sound XYZ have done has sold out. This drop will sell out in under 60 seconds. And the artist will have made two and a half ETH, which is about $8,000 today. In, a, in less than 60 seconds. Why is it so fast? I mean, Sound XYZ have been very clever building um, their platform and how it works. So yesterday, they did a drop with Selection. Selection's drop was 333 units. Is it loading? Why isn't it loading? Here we go. So it's an hour long mixtape with 16 artists. There were 333 units. They all sold out within an hour. So Selection raised $90,000 in one hour. It's all on split contracts, including the DJ and the curator. So 18 people on the split contract. And they all got paid out of this automatically. And then once it's, and you can see all the, everyone who, who, who grabbed one is here as well. And then once it's, once it's done, it's on OpenSea. The secondary secondary market. So if I go here um, to the open to open sea for it, you can see that since the drop, ten and a half ETH worth has been traded, and the lowest price, if you want to buy one right now, is 0.275 ETH. So almost double the initial price. So this is this is this is actually pretty unprecedented. A mixtape, multiple artists, everyone gets paid, including the DJ and the curator. And then it goes to secondary and it has sales happening. That's, that's pretty amazing. Um, let's just have a quick look at a few more platforms. Um, let's go, let's go to catalog. Catalog is, is it's invitation only, like a lot of these platforms are, um, but it's it's pretty much the catalog and sound XYZ are both invitation only currently. You can apply to be on catalog and they will eventually get the applications. With Sound XYZ, I think it's mostly about um, connecting with their Discord and being part of their community. But catalog specializes in one of one NFTs. So these are this is a chronological list of what's on there. You can see some of them, some of them have a, a reserve price, like this one here. The past was close, maybe. Bid 0.15 ETH. So the minimum. Bid is 0.15 ETH. That triggers an auction, which goes on for 24 hours. Highest bidder wins it. Here's one where the auction's already happening. Let it go. 18 hours to go. So we can see here um, who, who created it at QTCAS, who made the bid, and how much the bid was. There's only been one bid. So if there's no more bids, they'll win, they'll win the, um, the listing. So just to, to show, so here's my profile on catalog. 
So the eight one of ones from Motherlander here, you can see two of them haven't been sold. Um, Akatombo and Kodama Shei, because you can see it still says the bid price. And then one of ones I've done since, one of them hasn't sold, Journeyman. I'd never actually put up a one ETH one of one before, but it's interesting because there's narrative around music and I know something that's going to happen with this song, this instrumental in the future, which will justify its value to me. So I'm just leaving it at that price and you know, no one's bid on it. I'm cool with that. Like it's on the blockchain forever. Like a bid's a bonus. Um, okay, let's go to another platform. Okay, we looked at catalog. We looked at sound. We looked at selection on OpenSea, Zora. So Zora is a protocol, meaning that it's not just a platform, but it's a it's a system that anyone can build on top of. So if you had a dev, a coder, or could code, you could build a platform on top of Zora using their technology. But Zora is a anyone can anyone can mint NFTs on here. It's on mainnet on Ethereum, and it's a mixture of visual art, videos, music, um, and it's a platform like. I really, I really like a lot. Um, the, the team are great, very communicative, um, and there's a lot of great content on there. OpenSea, I mentioned before briefly. OpenSea is the go-to. It's like the Walmart of NFTs. You can find anything and everything. Um, I have seen some musicians drop on it on, on OpenSea. OpenSea is not music focused, but there's no reason why it can't be used like that. They have a great tooling called lazy minting, which means that when you upload an NFT, you don't pay the transaction fee or the gas to mint it. The buyer ends up paying that, which can be, that can have some advantages. Um, but also OpenSea is just, it, it trawls the internet for, or the, it, it trawls the blockchain for, for NFTs. So if you have an NFT on something else, it can appear on OpenSea. Um, that's, that's a little esoteric for those not familiar with blockchain tech, but sufficient to say OpenSea is the go-to for secondary market and can be used as a primary market as well. Mint Songs. Mint Songs is new. Mint Songs is built on a, on a blockchain called Polygon, Matic. Um, Matic is a layer two solution to Ethereum. That means it's built on the Ethereum network. It's not separate. Um, and there's a there's a lot of musicians here. The price point is much lower, but you know some of these it's like you know we're talking about a twenty to fifty dollar price point per track, which you know I mean you you couldn't get away with that on Bandcamp even. Yeah, you, know, you might briefly, but this is these are seen as cheap NFTs. So this could be a really great starting point for people. Um, and you can do editions, so multiple copies of one NFT. You can do one of ones. It's open to anyone. Nina, there's so many of these. Nina market is dope because it's art music. And a lot of people who make really weird shit, they're like, I don't know if there's a place for this on the blockchain. It's like, yo, there's a place for everything. So Nina is like, it gets, it's similar to Mint Songs in that you can do editions, the price point can be a bit lower. It's built on Solana, which is another currency. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm kind of going through these just to show you the breadth of what's already around. Async music, this shit is wild. So let's, um, here's Verite's one. So this is really interesting because basically each artist, when they release on async music, they're basically offering the stems as an NFT. And there are alternate stems. So say there's like, say there's three different drum parts and I buy the drums stem NFT. Then I, as the owner, I choose which drum stem is active in the actual mix. And then people can mint the current mix to what they call a black record. Um, see here, it says three platinum, 10 gold, 20, 2000 silver. So that's an interesting idea too, where this, this piece of music it keeps changing depends depending who owns what stems and what they choose to do. Um, super interesting use case. Groove time. This is a new platform which is focused around dancers. Dance obviously has a big intersection with music. Um, I've done a drop here with Brooklyn Terry, but this is dope because 
dancers have had a more raw deal than musicians have had. Like at least we had royalties, dancers haven't had nothing. So I'm really into this idea of the intersection of dance and, um, and music. And then, I mean, it kind of goes on forever. But what I will do is share these two, um, these two graphics, which can kind of give you an overview of how much this can go on forever. Here's one example created by um, Cooper Turley, uh, Cooper Trooper. And this is a few months old now, but it does show you how broad this landscape is. You know, top left, you have these one of one sites, then you have the addition sites, I showed you Mint Songs and Mina. You got these dance music sites, some artists of note. You've got research, academic research sites. You've got NFT ticketing tooling. You have generative NFTs, which is basically algorithms creating music. You have grants, collectives, or like the whole ecosystem is here already. And it's growing all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a founder in a team making a new Web3 music platform, which doesn't exist yet. And I know, I know we're not the only ones. So in six months time, this will look so different again. Um, a similar infographic, this was published by Water and Music, who are an academic research um, collective who are focused on Web3 music. And again, you can just see there's a lot. There's a lot here, a lot of options. And so it would behoove anyone to kind of have a look around and see, well, what resonates with me? What aligns with what I do? Like, for example, there's one here, Record Shop. And they're really, they're primarily EDM focused, but they're definitely really about dance music. They did a cool project recently where you had to buy an NFT, which was say, I think it was, I, I bought one just to see how the tooling worked. It was like five bucks. And with that NFT, you can then access a channel on, on, on their Discord and a Twitch stream. And these two producers and a vocalist are working on a track. And as they're working on the track, they'd offer up like kind of multi-choice preferences about the production in the Discord channel. So as an NFT holder, you get input on like, oh yeah, just double that chorus, or do you like this one or this one kind of thing? And then they ended up making everyone who contributed those suggestions, any suggestions which were in the final track, they get a little cut on the production end. And it's, you know, it's not big money, but it's great for community building and showing you know, the potential tooling here. So yeah, all these are very different and offer a whole lot. Um, I'm just rolling back into the type chat. To type chat, <laughs> are the NFTs linked in any way to the platforms on which they were minted or will they still exist if said platforms disappear? They'll still exist, this is the beauty, okay. So the data is stored in two places. One is called the IPFS, the Interplanetary File System, love the name. The other is called Arweave. And these are both node maintained data systems. So, all of these platforms could be gone tomorrow and you're good. That, that's, that's the whole point, right? The whole point is that we own our data. Um, 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 BLTN Radio, I've avoided interest in the space for several months, but I trust your thought process and how well articulated you are. Very informative, seed planted. Awesome. I'm happy to plant a seed, but also don't trust me. Like, do your own research. It's so vital. Like, for anyone to say, oh, Mark said do this, and then you lost a grand, that's not on me. Like, do your own research. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, crypto, I mentioned it's volatile before, and this does require, I mean, there's two, two aspects here. One is that creatives can, you can earn crypto by creating work creating art. That's amazing. Most people have to buy crypto. You can earn it. And if you do buy crypto, especially as a speculative investment or an investment portfolio, as everyone says, only put money in that you can afford to lose because it could go to zero. Like if for anyone who bought into something like Shiba Inu or Dogecoin at its peak, you know what I mean. It literally went to almost zero. Um, but then for people in the space who believe in the tech in the long term, we all know that Bitcoin and Ethereum and Solana, things like that, they're only going to go up. They'll go up and down on their way up, but 
believe me, like if, if Bitcoin's $35,000 today in 10 or 20 years time, I can't even imagine, like that's gonna be exciting. Um, Ryan, are there any platforms you're currently using to help bring utility to your NFTs? Lars, 500K Bitcoin, let's go. <laughs> um, but that's that shit too, when it's like, if you only have 0.01 of a Bitcoin, that's okay, like hold on to that, right? Um, so Ryan, platforms I'm currently using to help bring utility to my NFTs. So um, this is something which is it's a good question and it's constantly in evolution. There's a platform I like a lot called Telly. And actually it's invitation only. So I'm gonna paste my invite link. Um, let me just find it. Uh, so Telly is kind of like, at the very least, it's a replacement for link in bio. Um, in fact, while I'm finding the link, I'll share my primary Telly. Uh, it's a replacement for Lincoln Bio, but it also has things like token gating. So I'll put that link in the chat just for the moment while I'm finding my invite link. Um, give me one second. Here we go. Okay. So Telly is invitation only. And if you are interested in using it, it's free to click that link and sign up, no obligation. Um, but I think it's a really cool replacement for Lincoln Bio and then also um, token gating. Maurice, pleasure. I'm glad you could tap in. So let me show you a quick um, token gating example. So share screen. Share. Oh, why are we not loading? go here. Oh, what's happened? Do you hate that you got to show something that doesn't load? I will go out on, out on a limb and say it always works. This is unusual. Maybe, maybe at my end, I'm not sure. But yeah, Telly, great platform. Token getting is very simple to set up. This, so, many, so many of these tools now don't require technical knowledge, like if you understand the basic principles. So I'd recommend having a look at that. Um, also, you know, my, my Discord is absolutely um, a place where so much of this really comes to life. Um, for those not familiar with Discord, I'm sharing the screen right now of the Nashi Beats Discord. And so we have, I think it's about 400 people on here at the moment. We have weekly community calls, um, all sorts of info, people sharing general things, you know, music we're inspired by, Web3 chats, NFT drops music makers sharing ideas, people sharing their own work, options to reach out to create and collaborate. And then because we're not just music heads, we like food and books and all sorts of other stuff. Um, and I also use this with, with gated channels. On Discord, you can hide channels depending on who has access. So there's channels for the buyback holders, for the creator club um, participants, my Patreon people. Um, but yeah, just generally speaking, I would encourage use of Discord when you find one that kind of aligns with what you're interested in, who you're interested in. So I'm gonna also paste my Discord invite link in the chat. Anyone wants to join in, just tap in. It's very simple to tap in. When you tap in, you'll see this screen and you just click the green arrow and then you'll be able to see the whole server. And actually, I was just on a call before this call with someone doing similar work and he was asking me, man, do you have musicians who are just like, they, you have this conversation and then they start a Discord server straight away and want to launch a token straight away and all this kind of thing. And it's like, I do have that conversation with people and I would discourage anyone from jumping into that ahead of time. Um, running a Discord server, as Haley mentioned earlier, is akin to community building. So if you really want to build it, um, if you really want to build a community, yes, but I would definitely partake in community first to learn more before you build community. Um, James, this is a great question. The short answer is no. I know some people in our community that are interested in this area, but are there agencies, consultancies out there that you know that could help direct us, navigate, manage the space? So no, there aren't. And 
there's an aspect of this which could be problematic as well. Like even on Mashy Beats, when I started Creative Club, this cohort to mentor 10 musicians into the space, I had one friend tell me, man, if you do this again, you, should, you could charge people. It's like, well, yeah, I could charge people, but this is not why I'm doing it. Like, I want people to come into the space and understand it and be inspired and create in the space and be part of it. I, I get paid other ways. Like, and also, I mean, in community building is how it works, right? It's like, if we help each other, then if I have an ask at some point, you're probably going to help me too. So that's just human nature. Um, so if I saw a site which was like, you know, sign up for our $150, you know, how to NFT course, that's problematic. You know, I'm thinking, what is your game? What's your con? What's your scam? So anyone in the space will help you for free. But if you want to, if, if you want their time separate, um, or if it's an intersection with, you know, corporate or, you know, for example, I've been asked to do a talk for the NEA, the National Endowment of the Arts in the States, um, about NFTs, which is amazing. And, you know, that's not, they're not an independent musician, so it's a different approach. You know, I treat that as, as, a, as a business kind of transaction as well. Um, but that to say, as independent creatives in the space, all the info is out there, all the support is out there, the community is out there, and if someone is asking you for money to have access to that, then I would just dig a little deeper and see what is the value you're getting for that money? And is it, is it unique? Um, Lynn, yeah, is that NFT LA? I'm pretty sure it is. I've, I've seen some, some murmurs of that. So, the, and there is a, there's a question which that make me, makes me think about this. Um, oh, Yogi, the Discord invite is just below your request. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, man, but this is like, are we going to all be in the metaverse? And what about the real world? And it kind of comes back to the idea of this conversation where a live stream can never be as good as a live show. And I agree, you know, music is, music is meant to be experienced in person, live, in front, you know, right in front of us, right, in real life. And you could argue that, well, you know, a record will never be the same as a live experience or like television will never be the same as theater. So these things are different. Like the idea of, you know, digital space and metaverse, no one's trying to replace the real world. And a big challenge for all of us in the space is how do we connect what we're doing to the real world? How do we connect URL to IRL? And this is where utility comes into it. And you know, the idea that, you know, you might have NFT holders or token holders, and maybe they have access to all your shows, like, you know, they can come to the show and just get their wallet scanned and they're in, you know, whatever it might be. But, you know, we're essentially looking at, um, you know, digital community slash digital fan club, how does that connect? And how does it create value? Um, yes, Nick, it's a two way street, it really is. <laughs> So I think for the most part, I've covered the things I wanted to kind of share. Um, I think when it comes to, you know, best practices in, in getting started, I think a big part of it is about being present, listening, asking questions, not being shy to ask questions. There are no, there are no dumb questions. And I alluded to this earlier, like the idea of like people, especially musicians, like, man, I don't, I don't have time to be on Twitter. I don't have time to learn all this shit. I don't have time to blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, well, if you want to stick with your 0 0.003 per stream, then cool, you know, and, you know, work out what your next Instagram post is. But I'm, I see people's Instagram posts where I'm like, you put so much work into making that, that could be an NFT. And people still can look at it for free, but someone who loves your work, I'm telling you, they're going to collect it. And if you put a 10 ETH price tag on it, then they might not collect it. But if you just make it 0 0.1 ETH, then they probably will. Like, it's it's not it's not that kind of difficult in a way. Um, and we're we're very much at the very beginning of this technology and community and space. So, where where will it be in three to five years time? Who knows? No idea. But that we can be part of the adventure and the revolution and the tech and like to be part of it instead of playing catch up as I said a couple of times already, is just, 
it's so valuable to me. I just we, we've never had this opportunity. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if anyone has further questions or you know you're welcome to open mic and ask if you want to. Um, I know Lars definitely has a question. I can see it on his, on his face. <laughs> Can you connect NFTs to tangibles? This is a great question, man. And um, I, I, this is a challenge that everyone's looking at right now. And I'm, I've been looking at some use cases already. So you can't literally tether an NFT to a tangible, right? It's just, you know, it's, what's the word? It's physically impossible. It's a digital thing and a physical thing. So use cases that I've been talking to people about so far are things like, um, you know, one person has a like a fanzine for their band and it's it's beautiful. Um, and so we're like, well, what if you have a QR code in the fanzine? Like now, if, now thanks to the global situation, everyone knows what a QR code is. You know, if I'm a fan of this band and I get the fanzine and there's a QR code, you don't, even, you don't, you don't even have to tell me what it's for. I'm going to scan it. And then what, that takes me to an NFT and that NFT, I can unlock your archive vault or stems or some shit. Hell yeah, I'm there for that. Or maybe, or maybe you buy an NFT and then that goes to a token gated site where it's redeemable for a piece of merch that you can only get if you have that NFT. You know, so the ways to use it, I mean, those are two examples. There's literally infinite ways to use it. Like literally anything you can imagine is possible. And if the tooling doesn't exist, it can be built. And I say that to set to kind of like an illustration of that is this Web3 music platform I'm part of that I am not at liberty to even name yet. Um, but it started, it started off life because a Parisian saxophone player had an idea. And he mentioned that idea to a DJ who knows a lot about crypto tokenomics. And the DJ was like, man, we can build this with tokenomics and crypto. And then they had lunch with me and shared the idea. And I was like, this idea is wild. I'm on. I'm in. I'm on board. And so now a few months later, we have a team of about 15, including coding developers, designers, musicians, tokenomic experts. And we're building something that is going to go to beta in about a month and be public in a few more months later. And this idea exists now. Like pre-Web3. I couldn't have done that. What am I going to do? Go to, go, to, go to the Silicon Valley and knock on some text door and say, I'm a musician. I have an idea and I think you should build it. And by the way, we'll need $10 million in VC capital. Like it's just, it's just not, it's not going to happen. So the fact that in this space, you can have an inspiration and if a few other people think it's a good idea, it can literally be built. That is wild to me. You know, we didn't even have that option with streaming. They're like, Here's the, here's the iTunes store, lump it or leave it. Here's Spotify, lump it or leave it. Like, we didn't have a choice. Like, please. Um, David, yes, this is being recorded and I'm going to email an archive to everybody. Um, I'll probably just make it a public YouTube. I don't think I said anything too disparaging to anyone that I need to shield myself from. <laughs> no offense to anyone if I did. <laughs> um, Layla, I love the idea of NFT communities creating real world projects that help people. This is huge. This is so huge. And there are good examples of this already. Um, I know that somewhere like, uh, I don't want to get the country wrong. In Venezuela, I want to say, let's say a Latin American country currently that has inflation that is out of control, like, you know, a month's salary to buy a loaf of bread kind of thing. And citizens are not even able to open bank accounts. So if you take an example like that and you put crypto in it, well, one ETH is worth one ETH is worth one ETH everywhere in the world. Anyone can have a crypto wallet. Anyone can send and receive. Voila, we have something of a solution to a predicament. You know, there's people who there's people who've gone to, um, I guess, lower socioeconomic um, communities and. You know, communities in places where they're, where, where they're existing off a barter, off barter system only. And they've implemented a crypto token, especially for that community, for trading. And then just the way cryptography works, that becomes the currency. It increases in value, increases in circulation, and suddenly you have an economically viable community. 
Like there's, there's a lot of, yeah, economic parity. Thank you, Nick. Um, there, there, there's so many real world, world applications in every field. I mean, currently, I'm sure most of you are aware there are supply chain issues in the world where we have a lot of products, either we can't get them or they're expensive because of supply chain um, throttles. And there are crypto solutions being worked on for that. I mean, it's just, it can be applied in everything. Like I'm, I'm, I'm of the mind that this tech is gonna underpin every walk of life very soon. And we won't even know it in the same way that when you hit play on Spotify, you don't have to know about how to encode an MP3 or how an MP3 works or anything. You just hit play, right? And so that is what I can see being the future for sure. Like, you know, it might just be connect wallet and then the rest is done. But it, it, it's definitely complicated now. But for those who like the idea of what it is, it's like come into the come into the party. You know, come in. The water's warm. It's ready to go. There's a learning curve for sure. Um, and yes, Lars, Coinbase are going to launch an NFT market very soon. It's going to be huge. I mean, for those in LA, you know that Staples Center, which is where the Lakers play and the Clippers and all the big shows are, Staples Center is now Crypto.com Arena. You know, if you watch any UFC like kind of fighting thing, you'll see all of the fighters and their coaches, they all have crypto.com shirts on or Coinbase shirts on. Like the, the branding is, is going super mainstream um, because people see that it's, you know, people are interested and, and there's potential here. So I'm not saying throw out Web2. I'm not saying dismiss your entire music career, which is not on Web3. Um, I'm, I'm very much kind of putting a lot of my effort into it. And I believe that my web two music career will just do what it's doing anyway, without, like, I, I don't think what I do on Instagram actually has an influence on my Spotify numbers. So I'm just like letting that shit do what it does, but I'm putting my energy into something which I believe has real growth potential and can, can move the, move the dial in a way which has never been done before. I mean, I would, in the last seven months or probably in, in the last six months, my, my income from NFT sales is equivalent to eight times what I would stream on Spotify in a year. And, and that's off a limited number of assets. It's not that many assets. And I'm not including my buyback crowdfund, just the NFTs. So the, you know, the value proposition is pretty, it's pretty wild. And even if it's not, you know, everyone wants to sell a music NFT for one ETH or 10 ETH, but like I said, even if it's 0.1 ETH, that's two hundred and seventy dollars or something right now for someone to create a, to collect a digital collectible of your music, which gives them no rights, no master right or IP rights, but gives you access, gives them access to whatever you want to give them access to, and a feeling of connection to the creator, because that that's what a lot of people want. Super fans want to feel create, connected to the, to the creator. Like the average fan is just going to listen to you on Spotify, so they can just play the NFT for free anyway. It's all good. Um, Awesome, awesome, awesome. Lars, a buyer can do what they want with it, can they? So you could compare it to um, non-commercial rights. Like if, if you wanted to, you could do things like, you could say, if, if you buy this NFT, then I will put you on the splits for the DSPs. You could do that if you want. I mean, I would look at the SEC's securities regulations too. But in theory, you can do whatever you want with that. Um, no, they have no licensing rights. Like they have no master rights, zero master rights. But then wouldn't it be cool if someone collects one of my NFTs and then they're like, hey, Mark, by the way, I work at Apple and I, I, I can get you a sync on this. And then Apple give me $100,000. And then I would personally, I'd be like, man, thank you. Here's a cut. Like, absolutely because a sync agency would take 50%. So I don't mind giving like, you know, 25% or something. Um, so yeah, how, how you wanna use this is totally up to you. Like you could literally use it just as like a kind of a membership club pass on a really low cost chain, low cost NFTs. Or you might wanna be like, here's all my shit. Like if you have a music video, then Let's go. Like there's a music platform called Glass, a video platform called Glass XYZ, specifically for um, music videos. And 
there's plenty of people they'll they'll put out their video on um glass and then they'll put out the music as a one-on-one nft because th those are two separate assets the video and just the music and then they'll you know do their thing with it um layla anthony hamilton just sold 20 percent royalties on one of his nfts for twelve thousand dollars excellent um i haven't looked at that i wonder if i wonder if that's a drop on royal um and also with music, we do have to specify like when we say this kind of thing. So if that's 20% royalties on the NFTs or of his music royalties income, in which case I hope he's done it through the right legal channels because it is a securities fraud issue currently. Um, Hugo, this is a great question. This is great. You started by talking about how he built social media's value and then it got taken away by gatekeepers. How do we make sure this does not happen to NFTs once the infrastructure and adoption rate are fully built? Because we own our content. We're not putting it on a platform. Like the platform is basically reading the smart contract from the blockchain and the NFT contact content that that points to on the IPFS data system. And so you can take it off the platform and move it somewhere else. Like it's, it's yours to do. So a platform cannot rule anymore. It's just not possible. And then all the, all, all the communities, if they're truly web three, they're called DAOs, D-A-O, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. If you belong to a DAO, then you're a part owner in it. You have a, you have a vote there. And again, like I mentioned earlier, none of us had a vote at Facebook or anywhere, right? Um, yes, essentially, Layla, it's a cooperative, which is um, regulated by the token, but by the token. So the token being something which is, you know, can't be forged, can't be stolen, can't be changed. It is what it is. So it's it's a really safe way to work. Um, if we had a cooperative just using membership cards, then what happens when you lose your membership card or it goes through the wash in your favorite pair of jeans or something? You know, it's like game over. So we're trying to create a digital authenticity through all this. Um, awesome, awesome. We are coming up on two hours. Um, I'm sure everyone has stuff to do. I certainly do. And I hope everyone checks links. Um, if you have questions, I really encourage you to come into the Mashy Beats Discord. Um, I'll post the link again. And we do a community call every Monday, which also gets recorded. Um, and that's a great chance for people to ask questions as well. And I, I like to share kind of updates of the space that I've come across that week. Um, and yeah, absolute pleasure to do this. Like it's, we call it red pilling. Those who saw the matrix know what know the difference between a red pill and a blue pill, but it's all about red pilling. So <laughs> it's not poison. Take the red pill. <laughs> and, and each to their own too. If, if this is not for you, that's totally cool. You know, and in, in five years' time, it might just be underpinning everything anyway, and you won't have to worry about how to interface with it. But there's something happening now that you can be, be part of. So super excited. And Sabela, great to see you here. So yeah, any any final questions before we sign off? Lots of great questions, um, and you all, you know, you all really covered some of the some of the the important stuff. So, thank you all for sharing some time and space with me here, and I hope to see you, you know, in the metaverse because that's what it is ultimately. <laughs> I mean, and final thought: this Zoom, this is a metaverse. Like it, it starts like this. You know, I was saying to a friend of mine, you can imagine that. Zoom in a few iterations, maybe it might be kind of 3D of all our faces, and then the next iteration will be in the room with each other. Like it's inevitable. And that's this is this is the metaverse already. Um, Lars, declare your taxes. Yes, crypto is not tax-free. Income is income is income. Capital gains are capital gains. Pay your taxes. Um, another scam. You want to talk about scams? Taxes a scam. All right, you all have an amazing rest of your day, your night, wherever you are. Thank you again for joining me. And I'm just sending good vibes out and much love to everyone we might know in Ukraine and don't know there. Just hopefully the world's going to become a better place. All right. Peace, y'all.